This is Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia, a congregation full of life and love with a legacy of outreach ministries. Everybody's invited to church in person Sunday at 10 a.m. and online at mountpleasantatl.org. And now, the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta. to be praised from the rising of the sun going down the same your name is worthy to be praised we're thankful for what you are able to do amen let us go to the Lord in prayer together God, our Father, we're so thankful for this day, Master. Most of all, I'm thankful for your darling son, Jesus the Christ. Thank you for the privilege and the honor and the opportunity to celebrate you, to magnify you, to honor you, to worship you. And God, forgive us if we have failed to do it the way you have designed for us to do it. But show us how we are to do it, why we are to do it, what the purpose is for us doing it. God, this is your servant's prayer. In your darling son, Jesus the Christ's name, we do pray. Amen. 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 We bless God for all of you that's here on today. That's here on today. We bless God for your presence, for your participation. Amen. In this moment of worship, in this moment of celebration. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with us to the gospel according to John. That great sage writer, that great sage teacher. John's gospel, chapter number four. And verses 10 through 15, I'm going to do my best to try to get through this. John's Gospel, the fourth chapter. John's Gospel, chapter number four. John, the fourth chapter. And I want to look at verses 10 through, follow, 10 through 15. The scripture reads as follows. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Verse number 11, The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that life-giving or that living water are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock verse 13 Jesus answered and said to her whoever drinks of this water will thirst again but whoever drinks of, of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. May God have a blessing to the reading of his word and sanctify our soul and illuminate our pathway and give us strength and encouragement uh, to live this life. I want to tag this text during the sermonic spotlight. Uh, for those of you who may be viewing online, we do hope and pray that God uh, continues to inspire you, encourage you as we move through the passage of Scripture on the day. But I want to tag this text during the sermonic spotlight with this thought, and that is this. When God quenches your thirst. When God quenches your thirst. 
Another way of saying it, when God satisf satisfies your thirst. But I like the word quench. When God quenches your thirst. There is an untold story of Sprite's well-known slogan from the early 90s entitled, Obey Your Thirst. It talks about creating a campaign that spoke to the independent-minded, irreverent nature of the, sp the, spire, the Sprite consumer. Obey Your Thirst became the rallying cry for a generation that was not afraid of the question of questioning the status quo and going their way. It was in this word or in this world of advertising that few slogans have, have had the staying power and the cultural impact of Sprite's Obey Your Thirst. It takes us to a deep dive into a fascinating history of the Obey Your Thirst campaign from its inception is surprising afterlife in the world of entertainment. Various ones from Kobe Bryant to LeBron James and the various artists that were been able to be drawn in to be able to promote, announce, advertise, and become the center of the advertisement. But that slogan, that advertisement, that excerpt, if you will, that moment in time in which Sprite has been able to hold on for a significant period of time, one that has staying power, so much so that other industries that I shall not mention on today have gravitated toward that thought. But the most important thing is what I see that they have captured and what they have uh, corralled, if you will, and caused one to think carefully, strategically, and intentionally about one's human thirst. What is it that you are thirsting for? What is it that you need your uh, thirst to be quenched, your, your thirst to be satisfied in this moment? I want to suggest that Sprite raises a great question or raises a great, great statement, but it's so much ironic that they use soda to quench the thirst when in fact soda can increase the thirst. I wish I had a witness here. But it's interesting that the world and the place in which we reside have bought into it so much so that you will hear people walking into stores and being on field trips or even if that is not that that soda of the day, but that that slogan just captures your attention so much so that Coca-Cola has to run in with a different type of slogan in order to catch up, to keep pace with, keep track with this particular phenomenon that Sprite has captured, the obeying your thirst. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, there are many of us in this place on the day that are struggling, straining, and have become to a place in our lives where the thirst is overwhelming, the thirst is daunting, the thirst is pulling, the thirst is extracting, it, the thirst has a tendency to pull us down into places where the thirst will not be quenched but the thirst will be taking you on a roller coaster ride assuming that your thirst will be quenched and after being on the roller coaster ride for a while you realize that it was a fruitless ride because the ride did not end up to a place where you believe that your thirst would be satisfied settled at that moment don't check out on me when God 
quenches your thirst. Maybe the question on the floor today, but maybe if Sprite did not give you an idea about obeying your thirst or quenching your thirst or satisfying your thirst, maybe it is the pursuits that you think are perfect that have quenched your thirst. Maybe it's the attachments that you have in life that you believe that are so amazing that you believe that it has uh, 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 satisfied or quenched the thirst. Maybe it's the relationships that you assume that are rational that you believe that has quenched your thirst. Thirst. Maybe you think it's the decisions that you believe that are decent and you believe that it has quenched your thirst. Maybe it's the priorities that you believe that are practical and you assume that it will quench your thirst. Maybe it's the habits that you have that have become harmless and hindering and you believe that it will quench your thirst. Maybe it's the mindset that you believe that has motivated you to a place in life and have come to a discovery that it has not quench your thirst. Perhaps you being a loner is liberating but becomes a liability before God and you think that it is quenching your thirst. Maybe you believe that your identity is ideal but you are incomplete because you're still searching, searching and seeking and pursuing and chasing trying to fill a spot that only God can fill. And this is not a matter of pointing fingers. This is not a matter of picking you out or picking on you. Because if the truth is told, every one of us have salt lanes, got on avenues, walked down streets, turn curves, set up in locations that was not advantageous. So don't feel like you're on the outside looking in. Let's all get in this together and figure out how God can help us to quench this thirst. Listen to what happens, if you will. Let me just kind of paint the pictures. It's Jesus that finds himself in this strange location. Let me drop it if I can. It's important because the text says in verse number four that he had to pass through this way. Let me just give you a, a, a snippet or a snapshot if I can. It is believed that Jesus decided to leave Judea and travel north to avoid the potential conflict with Judea at the Judeans, uh, if you will, and uh, the John's disciples and this, this pack rat called the Pharisees. Both were afraid of his growing influence. He had become too popular. His name was being raised too much. They were talking about him too much. And you know when your name is being raised and being talked about too much in a very positive way, it's always somebody that wants to throw a little water on the fire surrounding your name. And here it is that he comes through, and he could have gone through three routes. He could have gone through the sea coast. He could have gone through the region of Perea. But he comes to the heart of Samaria. The custom of the Judeans of that day was to pass through this route because it was a shorter route. And so Jesus wants to take a shorter right route, but John, this sage of a writer, this sage of a teacher, this sage of a thinker, talks about the spiritual necessity for Jesus to take this route because he has a divine appointment, he has a divine destiny, he has divine declaration and a place in which he has to be at a certain hour of the day. Not by accident, not by coincidence, but by, God, by God's divine providence, he takes this route. And here it is, he has an appointment with a Samaritan woman, and it unveils his messiahship. It's less about her misery and her mayhem and more about his messiahship. But even in the midst of her misery and mayhem, the messiahship can take care of what was ailing her. Oh, here it is. Here it is. It, it, it's just a note. The formation of the Samaritan population was a result of the split of Israel after the reign of Solomon. 
which is the northern kingdom of Samaria, the capital and this entire area had been taken captive by the Assyrians. They had led 10 northern tribes away from the region and left a significant number of Jews in the northern Samaritan territory and transported non-Jews into Samaria. These groups, here it is, they began to intermingle and they began to engage with one another and there was an intermarriage between the groups and eventually there was a tension and a conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans. And as a result of that, these folk who were considered half-breeds, as the Samaritans were, they take themselves to a mountain and began to worship in a different way. Watch this. Uh, they don't worship the real God or the true God, but they worship in a different low. It was about for them about a location and not about their uh, acquiescing of, to a true and almighty God. And this same group didn't believe in the whole counsel of God. They only believed in the Pentateuch, which is the five, first five books of the Bible. And so they only had part of the story and not the whole story. As a result, the Jews rejected Samaritans and viewed them as heretics. And there was intense ethical problems, cultural problems, racism. So it ain't the first time that we've seen racism show up. Matter of fact, brother and sister, you don't have to just look at it on the news. You don't have to see it in our politics. You don't have to see it in the landscape of America. But here we have racism at its all-time highest, a cultural divide. It was a, it was a hatred of the Jews toward the Samaritans. Well, I wish I had a witness. I wish I had a time to really deal with this. But isn't it interesting how Jesus steps in the midst of isms and breaks down the isms that's between the two parties and brings them together, saying, yours is not right, yours is not right. I am the way. <laughs> And here it is, the truth, Alethius. And so instead of chasing cultural lies, political lies, and, and courtroom lies, this is the truth. So Chambers tell them this is what's happening in the scene. So Jesus is not there by accident. But there's a couple things I need you to notice in order for you to, for God to quench your thirst. How he quenches the thirst of this woman is interesting. It is intriguing. Uh, it is illuminating. It is inspiring. It lifts your spirit in the midst of a, lie, a place of liability. Even when, you're, when the pressure is on, when the pain is on, when you're being plummeted by problems, God says there's a place where you and I can quench our thirst. Don't look for a bottle of water. Don't look for DeSante. Don't look for the, the, public, the public's nature. He says, I got something that the world didn't give to you and the world cannot take away from you. Slavery can't take it away from you. When they don't put you in the books, it can't take it away from you. When they don't put you in the, the baseball hall of fame, it can't take it away from you. When they don't talk about the black folks that went to World War II at the, the scene of the, un, the folks, that it won't take it away. Because when you're carrying a right kind of bow, water into battle, that's next week's message. But here it is. When God quenches your thirst, here's number one. He causes us to wander toward an important station. Look at verses 5 through 7. I'm going to try to get through this if I can. But look what the text says. The text says, now a certain man. Now, here it is. The text is clearly for us to understand. Verse number 5. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground which Jacob gave to his sons, uh, Joseph. Notice what it says. And now Jacob's well was there. That's important for us to understand. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. And it was about the sixth hour, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Watch that. Park there. Notice a couple of things, if we can, if we are in the text, uh, to show you that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. His human body got tired. So anybody that said he ain't God, he ain't hewing at the same time. Well, all you got to do is take them to this simple passage of Scripture. How do you know, James? First of all, he took a shortcut. 
going a long way around will cause him to be more exhausted. But now he's tired. His body is physically tired. But here, here, here it is, here it is. But here it is. His weariness meets her in her weakness. His divinity meets her in the midst of her distress. She does not miss the meeting place, but she affirms her appointment by showing up. Let me see if I can put you up here. Wanders to an important place, a location, a meeting place. It's unusual, it's strange, but she's there. And the question of the hour is, are you canceling the appointments that God has for you? Are you walking past the place in which God intended for you to set up a conversation with him? Are you moving beyond the place where you're hearing God talking to you and you think it's a figment of your imagination? And you think that I didn't just hear God say, but it's so coincidental. It's not coincidental that it's at the same place around the same time you hear the same voice saying the same thing. You ain't got to admit it. That's, that's okay. But he wanders toward an important station in her life. They meet at the well. Not by accident, not by coincidence, but by divine providence. His weariness meets her weakness. His divinity meets her distress. His, his, his sovereignty meets her sickness. And now at this place, she doesn't just, just happen to be there or just happen to show up. There's no happenstance. There's, a, there, there's some divine, divine uh, uh, providence that happens and occurs in the life in which we live. So because here it is, let me see if I can get off track one. And the things that we are watching and observing and seeing in our culture is not by chance. God has seen this movie before. And here it is. God is the only one with editorial rights. You can't change it. You can't shift it. You can't move it. Whatever God has destined to happen in this moment in time, he's meeting us even in the midst of a disturbance, even in the midst of cultural upheaval, even in the midst of political lies. He's meeting us there. And how will we respond at the meeting? How will we conduct ourselves at the meeting? But notice what happens, if you will. The text says... Uh, Verse number five through seven, it says he wanders toward an important station. What important station in your life have you missed, moved beyond, have not seen, have not observed? But God says, we got a meeting place. Are you showing up? Are you canceling the appointments? Have you failed to see the divine text from God? Have you failed to look at your patient portal that says you have a meeting with God at such and such time on such and such day? Have you failed to go to the mailbox in which God has sent you a letter and said, we got a meeting on such and such day? Have you failed to read the letter or have you done like many people have done, taken the letter and put it in file number 13? And then when the date comes and the date shows up, something disturbs you. Something moves you. You know something is supposed to go down. You know something is supposed to happen. And you know there's a meeting that's supposed to take place. Let me show you what happens. As a result of that, now she begins to wrestle with an internal seduction. Look at verse number 7, B and following. It says, the woman of Samaria came to, to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew? Here it is. Here it is. How is it that you being a Jew? Now notice what she asked. Ask of me of being a Samaritan woman. Here it is. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. We're considered half priests. We left the party a long time ago. We no longer believe in the whole counsel of God. We only believe in the first five books of God. You call us a heretic. You said that we were culturally unfit. 
You said that we were unclean. How is it that you're going to mess with the stuff that the world calls messy? How are you going to engage with something that the world has extracted from the place of God? How are you going to talk to something that God and the other people that you say have trivialized us? How is it that you're talking to me with all the stuff I got going on with me? How is it that you're talking with me? She wrestles with the internal seduction or belief because she believes that she's a social outcast. And as a result, she believes that she's undervalued and unrecognized. And in, in this moment, in this moment, in this time, but Jesus has a conversation with the socially outcast. Jesus begins to talk to people that other folk don't want to talk to. Jesus spends time with the people who are trivial, the people who cause troubles, who cause problems. He spends some time, and she has to wrestle with the fact of the undervalued, and she has become unrecognized. How many of you feel that way? How many of you have been in that place and asked the same question? How can God quench my thirst when I wrestle with this internal seduction or this internal belief and that I have become persuaded that I am nothing because the culture says that I am nothing. The Jews, the mainline people, the privileged crowd says I am nothing. But Jesus, who created all, says that I am somebody and not something. So in order to begin to quench your thirst, you got to wander to the important station. you got to wrestle with the internal seduction. It's normal, it's natural to deal with that stuff when the world has, has plummeted you with all the negativity, has plummeted you with saying that you're nothing and you're nobody and you'll never amount to anything. No wonder. When it's time for us to be recognized, when it's time for us to be identified, when it's time for us to be separated and given an award, medal of honor, medal of freedom. Why is it that we're still having to chase stuff that rightfully belongs to us? Because of the cultural divide, because of these barriers. But Jesus came in to break it down. Here it is. Here it is. It's interesting. It's interesting that even, even the culture of the Jews had a tendency to try to create something that God had not created. To make other folks feel less than. And they felt more than because they believed that they were the selected and chosen people of God. But here it is. Jesus says, it's okay for you to wander to a, an important station. It's okay for you to wrestle with an internal seduction. But he says, Chamber, he says, Chamber, tell them. But not only that, but she weighs the increasing satisfaction. Watch this. Verse number 10 and following, it says, Jesus answered, said, if you knew the gift of God, who it is, who says you give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you, here it is, life water, life giving water. Not just living, not just natural water, natural water is okay. Because we've seen that in the city of Atlanta. The world goes crazy in a nutshell. But when you think about all the main lines that have been broken, have been tarnished, and, and you got the Corps of Engineers showing up. You got the city on, on 24-hour life. You got people ringing the, the phone. You got various ones saying, where's my water? I put my hand on the faucet, and the faucet is supposed to turn because at the first of the month, it took everything I had to pay that water bill. It took everything I could get together to muster together, but I needed to make sure I had some water. But when I went to turn the water, it was just drip, 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 drip. And as a result of me not having no natural water, my business shut down. As a result of me not having no natural water, concerts shut down. As a result of me not having no natural water, uh, entertainer centers jumped down. Uh, the aquarium shut down. No water, no water, no water, no water, no water. Can you imagine 
And in that short period of time of experience not having that natural water and everything being shut down and you're waiting by the corner for people to drop off cases and loads of water, you're calling your friends and your family and saying, I may have to drive another 15, 20 minutes just to take a shower, just to cook because the water here is unsafe. Watch this. It's unsafe. It's only dripping. Thirdly, I don't know when they're going to turn it back on. And when they turn it back on, I still don't know whether or not it's going to be safe. You need water to sustain your life, to hydrate, to make sure these old bones work the way they ought to work. To make sure you got flexibility and mobility. To make sure that something has not caused a juggernaut inside of your internal uh, working mechanisms and organism. You need that water. But the difference between that water and the water that Jesus is offering is a wellspring that is not endless, that's not interrupted, that's not contaminated, that does not have somebody turning it off, that's not governed by old systems and not waiting for something to break. It does not have to have workers on duty. It does not have to bring somebody from across the street. It does not have to bring anybody across the state. The Corps of Engineers don't have to show up. Matter of fact, can I tell you who is the water authority? God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they all make one. And when they assemble and they say, turn it on. And when you turn it on, don't allow it to drip, but make sure that it flows and overflows. I wish I had a witness. Let me see if I can really deal with it the way I want to deal with it. He says, I want you to meditate on the thirstless theory that it was presented to her. I came to give you living water. So when you're lonely, when you're in despair, when you are discouraged, when you are emotionally dry and drained, when there is no peace, when there's always places where you're searching for satisfaction and you just can't get no satisfaction nowhere. God says, I am a spigot. I wish I had a witness that I could do it the way I was. You know, I am country. I, I am a spigot that you cannot cut off. I, yeah, I said cut off. Meditate on the thirstless theory that was presented to her, but she also had to move beyond the past pre presidents that was embedded within her. She said, you don't know my people. My people have said that there was a well that was built, but she was caught up in a past precedence, a past symbol from the book of Genesis. She was caught up in it. She believed. Now, you got to understand this. So why is that important, Chambers? Because, remember what I said earlier, she only believed in the first five books of the Bible. So she couldn't get past the fifth book. And all she had was the story of the first book. Did not realize that Jesus is the book. Did not realize that he's the Alpha and Omega. Did not know that he was the beginning and the end. Did not realize that he is that living water. Not only does he have, the, he doesn't have two avenues. He has one avenue. He gives you eternal life and abundant life. So she had to meditate on this thirstless theory that was presented to her. Then she had to move beyond the past precedent that was embedded within her through 10 through 15. Look what the text says. 13 says, whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give will never thirst again. It's a fountain of water springing up into everlasting water. Now notice when she recognized, the woman said, sir, give me that water. Don't give me Sprite. Don't give me Fanta. Don't give me Coca-Cola. 
Don't give me lemonade. Don't give me sweet tea. Give me that water so my dark nights won't be remain dark nights so my moments of depression will not derail me or cause me to become detached because at this moment when I have this living water when my emotions are unmanageable and they are tangled up you can turn them inside out and straighten it up because I have that living water that straightens things out that smooths things out that helps things out that pushes me forward that moves me in the right direction give me that drink Jesus said I am that living water and why is that important because you got to understand that she, she was worshiping a different type of God and there are all kind of gods out here and you got to be careful of these gods that will control you, that will consume you, that will contaminate you. But I want to tell you this. Jesus, that's the difference between Jesus being fully human and fully divine. He is a God that has never lost a case. Uh, he, he, he's, he's a God that is not only a living one, he embodies life. He is life. So why wouldn't you want to have a hookup with the holy, a affinity with divinity, a connection with Christ? Because in him, he moves, he lives, and he breathes. He is living life, and he breathed in us life. And why not connect to the one who has breathed into you? So here it is. Here it is. Let me see if I can get through this here. He weighs the increase in satisfaction. Text says, here's what I really like. But she works through the intentional sensitivity. Verse 16 through 19. Don't check out on me. Jesus said to her, go call your husband. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. That's a message within itself. Why, Chambers? Why is, why is that a message within? It's the absence of the words in the moment of truth. The absence of words in the moment of truth when you know you can't do nothing but say, uh-huh, 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 mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you're right, yeah, uh, um, uh, mm-hmm, uh, yeah. She's not argumentative, she's not attacking, and she's not avoiding, but she is acquiescing to the affirmative words of Christ. Because not only is he living water, but he's also living truth. Let me see if I can help you here. She works through the intentional sensitivity. She works through that moment of time. She doesn't, but, but you don't understand. But, but, but you don't understand. You don't, you don't know my situation. You don't know my you don't, But no, 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 no. She's not argumentative. She's not attacking. She's not avoiding. She's not isolating. She's not making excuses. She's not blaming anybody. But now notice what happens. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you've had five. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke the truth or you spoke truly. And I think that Jesus had a special appreciation from this woman because she didn't run from it. She didn't hide from it. She didn't duck from it. She didn't blame anybody. She stood up there like a woman and just received what God had said and what God recognized, what was wrong, what was the problem, because her sin was making an announcement. And the Savior had to give an answer to the sin that was making an announcement. So here she is. So here she is. You have five. You've been shacking. Y'all together. You ain't got no paper. Nobody official worth anything has signed anything. You just hanging out together. You just laying and playing. (laughs) <laughs> he got the cow, but he don't want to pay for the milk. 
And then when he dies, you ain't got no cow, you ain't got no milk, you ain't got no land, you ain't got no income, you ain't got no social security, you ain't got no house, you ain't got no car. You call the church to beg, borrow, and skill. You don't put out a cash app fund. You don't put out a GoFundMe. For <laughs> she works through the intentional sensitivity. I like this woman because she don't hide from her stuff. It is what it is. I messed up from the flow up. My flesh is a mess. I'm jacked up. I got this going on. I ain't trying to hide it. I ain't trying to front. Yes, I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not proud of it. But I think I thank God I didn't die from it. Don't get all mad and upset. That's why a lot of preachers and pastors now don't preach what they're supposed to preach. Because they're scared. Oh, let me make another note since I'm here. There's a difference between one who has been called versus one who has chose a vocation. All right, I got to finish this, y'all. <laughs> Works through this stuff. But notice what happens, if you will. The woman said to her, perceive that you are a prophet. Our father worship on the, again, we talked about it again. Your worship is not about your location, but it's about your heart, heart relationship with Jesus the Christ. One ought to worship. Jesus said, the woman, believe me, this hour is coming when you will neither worship in the, in the mountain nor in Jerusalem. Worship Father. You must worship. You do not know. We do not know what to worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit not in attainment, not in showcasing, not in bringing the latest fad in the culture, not trying to become viral on the internet, not to show up in a popcorn suit. Y'all know I'm having problems today. I'm sorry. I'm not having problems. I'm having problems. But to worship him in spirit and in truth, to, to worship him, how Chambers, sincerely, sincerely, Honestly, openly, genuine, being genuine, and consistently. Because the Bible says in Hebrews, forsake not thyselves of assembling together as is the custom of some others because we are here to worship him. We are to worship him in spirit and in truth. Coming to worship is a case of the can't help it. Because if you don't worship, you go dry. If you don't worship, you will always live your life on 87 rather than on 93. Go to the gas station. Maybe I'll help you here. Unleaded it versus supreme. And here it is, now watch this, here it is, this is how good God is. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I had a conversation with a gas station one day, and I noticed that the unleaded runs out fast first. But if you're topping off with supreme, you don't have to have to worry about anybody in the line you don't have to worry about it running out. You don't have to worry about the sign saying out of order, out of order. I said, my God, why do we got a, we got a gas crisis and all now BJ's at 87 is out. Sam's 87 is out. And I try to go to those little places a little bit cheaper. You know, I got to save my little nickels and quarters. And, I, and if I go to the high end, those one that maybe in mid, midtown, the mid city, and you got to pay the higher. So I try to stick on the places. I'm, 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 I'm conservative with a little, my cash because, but I know that the 87 runs out quicker than the supreme. And I want to tell you, when you worship God in spirit and truth, that's when you have decided to fill your life up with supreme gas. Because with supreme gas, you don't have to worry about the car going bump it, bump it, bump it, bump, 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 bump it, bump it, bump it. You don't have to worry about it being jerking and pulling. It gives you a smooth ride. And brothers and sisters, that's what Jesus is trying to tell us here. He says to worship him in spirit and truth, not any kind of way, because he is spirit. And not just any kind of spirit. 
and in us is spirit. We are mind, body, soul, and spirit. And you got to connect with him with what's in you. Jesus said, tell him, Chambers, he says. Notice what happens. You see the submission. You see the spirit. But also, brother and sister, you see the stripping. What do you mean, Chambers? Well, the Bible says, and verse number 28, the woman, after having this encounter with Jesus, she left her water pot. Because you got to understand, during the day, it was normal for her to come with a collection of people. But because of her shame, she comes at a particular time of the day and meets this man with a water pot, carrying it there. But the interesting part is, is that when she went there, she had a water pot. But after she left, she dropped the water pot. And everything that the water's hot pop uh, assemb uh, symbolized or affirm, she left it behind. And I stopped by today to tell you that maybe there are some water pots that you have been carrying in your life. And it's held you down for a long period of time. But I stopped by today to tell you, you don't have to come in. Go out the same way you came in. For Jesus will cause you to drop your water pot. But not only will he strip you, but he'll change your speech. Because verse 29 says, come see a man that told me about all the things that I ever done. Uh, and so I stopped by today to tell you that I am a living witness uh, that God will quench your thirst. Uh, He'll give you more meaning, uh, and he will give you a purpose in life. Uh, you don't have to run around uh, and go chasing waterfalls. Uh, all you got to do is uh, trust in the Lord uh, with all thy heart, uh, and lean not to thy own understanding. Uh, in all thy ways acknowledge him, uh, and, and, and he shall uh, direct thy path. Uh, I'm so glad that I found out a long time ago uh, that money won't do it. Uh, relationships won't do it. Uh, prestige and prominence won't do it. Uh, and even friends that you thought was a big network uh, won't do it. Uh, because even they uh, will leave you behind. Uh, but I stopped by today to tell you uh, that as long as you got your hand uh, in the Lord's hand, uh, he will uh, take care of you. Uh, no weapon uh, formed against you uh, shall be able to prosper. Uh, weeping may endure for a night, uh, but I heard the writer saying uh, that when your thirst has been quenched, uh, when your thirst has been satisfied, uh, joy will still uh, come in the morning. Uh, you don't have to hunt for joy. Uh, you don't have to chase joy. Uh, you don't have to watch for joy. Uh, but I hear Nehemiah saying uh, that the joy of the Lord uh, is my strength. Uh, is there anybody in here uh, that can testify uh, that God will uh, satisfy your thirst? Uh, and won't he do it? Uh, won't he take care of you? Uh, if you know he will, uh, why don't you, why don't you uh, holler back at a brother uh, and say he will uh, give you satisfaction? Uh, Y'all heard that song? Uh, I just can't uh, get no uh, satisfaction. Uh, is there anybody in here uh, that can turn it around uh, and say through Jesus uh, and Jesus alone, uh, I am satisfied. Uh, won't he do it? Uh, won't he take care of you? Uh, if you know he's all right, uh, help me say all right.
saying. I hear C.C. Whiny saying, for your mercy never fails me. All of my days, I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God because all of my life, you've been faithful. All of my life, you've been good. With every breath that I take, I'm able to sing about the goodness of God. Have you heard anything about him? You led me through the fire. You led me through dark nights. You're close when nobody else is. I wonder, do you know him? I heard Grandmama saying that he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Have you ever tried him? See y'all later. Hasta la vista. Hasta la vista. I got to get out of here. here. It's getting late in the evening and the sun in a few hours is going down. But I'm so glad that I got my hand in the Lord's hand and can't nobody shoot me like Jesus. Can't nobody rock me like the Lord. If you know he's all right, help me say all right. If you know he's all right, put running in your feet, clapping in your hands. Unspeakable joy. Yeah. Yeah. Won't he do it? Y'all excuse me. I know it's Sunday morning, but I got a Friday night feeling that everything is going to be all right. Have you ever tried him? Won't he make a way out of no way? Won't he, won't he, won't he? Won't he, won't he, won't he? Won't he, won't he, won't he? Grab your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor. Won't he, won't he, won't he? Won't he, won't he, won't he? If you know he's all right, help me say yeah. Yeah. Every now and then, uh, when it gets so good uh, and you can't help yourself, uh, help me say yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You've been listening to the Mount On The Go podcast. If you've been enjoying the word, please consider donating to the Mount Pleasant ministry. We have various ways that you can give to the ministry to allow us to become better in our pursuit of delivering God's word to you. You can give via PayPal at mtpleasantatl.org. You can give via Zale, info at mtpleasantatl.org. You can also give via Square and Givelify. For Givelify, just search for Mount Pleasant Baptist Church with our address, 17 Melvin Avenue, Southeast Atlanta, Georgia, and you'll be in the right place. In addition to all these options, you're always welcome and invited to grab an envelope and have cash or checks sent to the church, whose address is again, 17 Melvin Avenue, Southeast Atlanta, Georgia. For questions, comments, and concerns, feel free to email us at info at mtpleasantatl.org. That's info at mtpleasantatl.org. You can also visit our website, www.mountpleasantatl.org, to follow us on YouTube and Facebook for the video version of the podcast. Our services are live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you are more than welcome to visit the church in person every Sunday at the same time. Thank you so much for listening.